Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delights. For in you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Sunday after the Epiphany is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 62nd chapter. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. 
The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Epistles from St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the 12th chapter. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, 
to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. When the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God.
this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dear saints, we have been uh, speaking quite a bit about marriage lately, and there's reason for that. The text invites it to us, uh, invites us to it again today. I don't want to say too many things, but we know that this is one of the flashpoints between the world and the church over the question of marriage, what is it, what's right, and what's good. Uh, I was with, uh, we were having a Bible study this week uh, with doxology and a number uh, of us were there together and the point was made, and I think this was, this was kind of helpful, is that during the Enlightenment, the, the world criticized the church for being irrational. Our doctrine of creation, uh, our doctrine of history, our understanding of the miracles, this was rejected as an irrational doctrine. But the criticism of the world has changed now, and instead of, I mean, I suppose the world still considers the church irrational, but but now the accusation is that the church is immoral, that the church is wrong. It's it's, it's perhaps good for us to kind of get our heads around this, that when the world looks at the church and the teachings of what we say is good and right regarding man and woman, regarding marriage, in fact, there's probably four things, race and marriage and, and gender or sex and and also a warfare, when the world looks at the church's doctrine, it sees it as a wrong teaching, a dangerous teaching, and immoral. And it's, and it's the sola that gets us in trouble. I mean, remember in the, in the Reformation, uh, the Lutherans said that grace alone and faith alone and Scripture alone. It wasn't the grace. Everybody believed in grace, but it's saying grace alone, that's where the problem is. Or everybody had the Bible, but it's when you say Scripture alone, that's where the problem comes in. And well, so it, I suppose it is when it comes to questions of man and woman, and we say, well, that's, that's it. Those are the only options. Or, or marriage is a man and a woman, and, and we say that's truly what marriage is. And, and the world gets uh, riled up at that. It hates to hear it. It wants to hear something different. So for us to know, this is just good for us, to know that the pressure from the world comes to the church in these areas, and it will continue to come in regards to the biblical teaching of what marriage is. So we're ready for that. But the thing that I want to think about this morning is not so much about what the text reveals about marriage. We want to see what the text reveals about Jesus. That, after all, is what Epiphany is about, the revelation of Jesus. But how wonderful for us to remember that Jesus here decides to perform his first miracle and sign, which is a miracle that preaches. That's that's what a sign is. It's a miracle that indicates something further. Jesus chooses to to perform his first sign and miracle here at a wedding feast. There's a beautiful part of the wedding liturgy where it says that Jesus blessed and hallowed marriage by his presence and first miracle at Cana in Galilee. So when our Lord Jesus is pleased to accept the invitation to this wedding and to come to the wedding with his disciples, he's saying that this is good, that the Adams and the Eves marrying one another, joining together in marriage, having children, that he blesses that. Beginning to end, the Lord blesses it and delights in it. But there's a problem at this wedding, and that is that the wine ran out. And Mary notices. Now, you'll notice in the text how it begins. It says, the third day there's a wedding at Cana, and Mary was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited there. It doesn't say that Mary was invited. It seems like Mary is there with a different purpose. Maybe she knew the family. Maybe she was helping support the marriage or the marriage feast or something like this. But Mary notices before really anybody else notices that the wine is run out, and this is perhaps one of the worst things to happen at a wedding feast, especially in the ancient world. This was a a matter of pride that the wine was served for the days of the wedding feast. And Mary notices that the wine runs out and she turns to Jesus and says, the wine is gone. Now, someone asked me last week, 
Because remember last week we were talking about uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the temple when he was a boy, and they were looking for three days and can't find him, and then, and then Mary find, and Joseph, they find Jesus, and she rebukes him, where were you? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business, Jesus said? And, and so Jesus uh, is uh, rebuking Mary, and yet he goes home, and it says that he remained faithful, and he honored his father and his mother all the way through. And Mary pondered these things in her heart. So from the beginning, I mean, from when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and announces that she's going to be pregnant with Jesus, to the the visit of the shepherds, to the visit of the wise men, and to the preaching of Anna and Simeon in the temple, to to the visit of the temple when Jesus is 12 years old, Mary is thinking about these things. Who is this, her son? Who is this now, in the text, 30 years old, who is this man, my son? Who is this Jesus? Mary's trying to figure these things out. And Mary perhaps heard of the baptism of Jesus by John and the descent of the Holy Spirit, and and she is thinking, is it time? I mean, remember, Jesus, as far as we can tell, never performed any miracles or never indicated His divine power in any way up until this point. It's the first miracle He's doing. And so Mary is waiting and watching And now at the wedding, she's saying, is it time? Are you now going to show yourself to be who I think you are, who I know you are, the Son of God? Is it it time now? And Jesus answers her and says, no, (laughs) it's not the hour. My hour has not yet come. Now, Jesus is going to perform the miracle, so he must mean something different by his hour is not yet come. And this comes when we look in the Gospel of John and see that almost always that hour is the hour of his death. That's the hour that was to come. But Mary looks at Jesus and looks around at the feast and looks at the servants who are there, and she says, do what he says. It's an amazing thing that these words here are the last recorded words of Mary in the Scripture. And and that maybe is just something for us to meditate on. It's it's something helpful when we're having conversations with our family and friends from the Roman Catholic Church that just gets carried away with their thoughts and teachings about Mary, is to remember what the very last words of Mary are. Listen to Jesus. Mary doesn't want to stand between us and her son. Go to Jesus, listen to Jesus, pray to Jesus, receive gifts from Jesus. Whatever He says to you, do it. So there's six water pots of stone there. According, and John is careful to tell us this, according to the rites of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. The rabbis were crazy about purification. I mean, they just loved to think about it, to write about it, to practice it. There's all these handbooks of rabbinic lore about how to be a good rabbi, and the biggest one, the biggest volume, is the volume on purification. How to wash your hands, how to wash your feet, how to wash your head, how to wash your clothes, how to wash your couches, how to wash your homes, to, you know, the ritual washing, how to wash your food, how to, all of these sorts of things. There was a joke in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus that said the mark of a good rabbi is he could make clean an, a bug, <laughs> which were declared unclean by Moses, but he could apply so many rites of purification to him that you could declare the bug to be clean. That was, the, that was what the Jews were all about. And so there's all this water that was there, probably set aside for the bride and the groom and the attendance of the bride and groom for all the rites that they would have to go through for purification according to the rabbis. And Jesus is specific in this. He says, you see those, uh, those water pots there that are set apart for purification? Take them and fill them up all the way up and then draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And he does. The servants do it. They fill it up to the brim, and they bring the water to the master of the feast, and it turns out that it is now wine. When the master of the feast tasted the water, made wine, 
and he didn't know where it came from. It's, a, it's amazing to me that Jesus is keeping this miracle on the down low. The bride, the groom, the master of the feast, the parents of the bride and groom, the people there, they don't know where the wine came from. <laughs> they don't know where it, uh, what happened. In fact, there's only two people who know, uh, two groups of people who know, the disciples of Jesus and the servants. I was thinking about it this week. You know, if you woke up on the morning of this wedding and you're like, hey, everyone is probably pretty excited to have a wedding that day. The bride and groom, no doubt, were excited about the wedding. The, the parents of the bride and groom were excited about the wedding. The, the wedding f- guests were excited to go to the wedding feast. I imagine the only people who woke up that morning who were like, oh, well, we got a wedding today were the servants. That's a lot of work, serving at a wedding. But they are the ones that Jesus lets in on the secret, <laughs> They're the ones that know what happened. They're the ones that know who Jesus is. They're the ones that see it and, and listen and watch and know now that the water has been turned to wine. It says, the servants who drew the water knew. This reminds me of the, the psalm where it says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. It's, it's better to be one of the Lord's servants and to be in on who he is than to be anywhere else. But the master of the feast tastes this wine, and it turns out that Jesus just doesn't turn water into wine. Jesus turns water into good wine, <laughs> into the best wine. It's a, you know, John didn't have to tell us this, but he wants us to know it. He wants you to know that when your Lord Jesus turns water into wine, he turns it into the finest tasting wine, and we hear about it in this joke. The master goes to the groom, and he says, you mess things up. Don't you know? You're supposed to serve the good wine at the beginning, the nice stuff first, and then when people have had a couple of glasses and they don't know the difference between the bottle and the box, then you bring out the cheap stuff. (laughs) But you, you've waited to serve the good stuff now. A huge mistake. I, I think I've told you this. My imagination can't get off of this idea of John who's writing this, in his old age, probably from Patmos. Remember that John was, he was a, a young disciple of John the Baptist and his brother James, and John the Baptist says, go follow Jesus, and so he's one of the first disciples of Jesus. He's with Jesus all through the three and a half years of his ministry. Remember John, his parents, his dad, Zebedee, he, he had a fishing fleet in Galilee. He also had a home in Jerusalem. He was well known to the high priest, uh, so he traveled in all these circles, He was the only apostle who wasn't killed for his faith. He died in his old age, although in his old age, he became the pastor and the bishop in Ephesus, and he was exiled to Patmos. That's where he received the revelation. And then back in Ephesus, he was the caretaker of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus from the cross says, behold your son and behold your mother. This John, okay. I like to imagine John as the old man bishop in Ephesus with his old white beard and these old bishop robes, and he would stand up and preach. He would go and he'd visit people in their homes, and he would sit with people, and he would have dinner with them, and they would put before John a, a food and, and, a, and a glass of wine, and I think that every time that John would have taken that glass of wine, he would have sipped the first sip and tasted it and thought to himself, Not as good. (laughs) Not as good as the wine that Jesus made this day at the wedding in Cana. So that Jesus takes this water for purification and gives it to the wine of gladness and joy to all the people who are there. Now this is the first sign that Jesus does in Cana of Galilee. And he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. We mentioned before that a sign is a miracle that preaches. And we don't want to miss the preaching of this miracle. In fact, let's let this miracle preach two things to us. Number one, Jesus is God. There's this very old joke about this text. I don't know, I, I was reading a, I was reading a, 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 a Bible uh, commentary that's like 150 years old, and it mentioned how old this was. So I don't know where this comes from, but it says that the, you know, the wine, the water uh, came out of the jar, and it saw its Lord, and it blushed <laughs> and became wine. 
Now, I think that's kind of a silly joke, but it gets to the point is that Jesus is the one who, who can do this miracle. He is God in the flesh. He is God with us. He's the one who created the world in six days. He's the one who will recreate the cosmos on the last day. He, he's the one who upholds the, the world. He, he can perform miracles, and he does this day. Water to wine, no big deal. But there's a second sermon that the, that the sign preaches, and, and it's this. It's that Jesus is replacing all of the human attempts to be clean and pure on our own terms with the joy of the wedding feast. Jesus, in this sign, is establishing what his church would be about, is about. I I have been reflecting, continuing to reflect on what it is that the world thinks that the church does. What what do our neighbors think that we're doing when we come in here? I think this is helpful for us to think about. What, What does your family, who doesn't come to church, think that you do when you come to church? Gather around the water pots and figure out how to be pure. Gather around the water pots and figure out what we need to to do to be clean while the world is unclean. To gather around here and talk about how good we are and about how bad everybody else is. I think that's probably what the world thinks that we're doing. We're puffing ourselves up and we're diminishing them, that we're talking about how great the Christians are and how, about, how bad the non-Christians are or something like this. No, we, we come gathering to the Lord's church not because we are holy, not because we are good, not because we are clean, not because we are pure, but because we need, most of all, the Lord's mercy. That's why the very first thing we say when we gather here in the Lord's church is, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And if you can't say those words, then you should leave because this is a place for sinners. The Lord Jesus deals with us in that way as unclean, unholy, unpure, as lawbreakers, which we are. And we have deserved his temporal, his now, and his later eternal punishment. We are better than no one. We are sinners in desperate need of the Lord's mercy and kindness. But what does the Lord do? Does He judge us according to our sins? Does He cast us off in His anger and wrath? Does He he give us a bunch of rules to keep so that we can manage our own holiness? (laughs) Jesus turns water into wine. (laughs) He prepares a feast for you. He comes to you with with joy, with happiness. This is wonder of wonders. Did you get the line at the end of the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 62? You know, we often think about how we should think about the Lord Jesus and what, how we should consider Him. But, but how wonderful to think that the Bible tells us how God thinks about us. And listen to what it says. It says, as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. How does God think of you? He delights in you. He rejoices over you. He he loves you, and he's invited you to the feast. Whenever Jesus wants to capture the joy of heaven, you know what he does? He calls it a wedding feast. In fact, when you get to the last page of the Bible, that's what's there, a wedding feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Jesus is the bridegroom, and we, his people, are the bride, and we will be with him in joy eternally, unending in peace that knows no limits or no bounds. And this first sign at Cana is just the beginning. Jesus still comes to manifest His glory. And for us, it's a little bit different. Instead of turning water into wine, He starts with wine and He adds for you and I His blood. The blood of the New Testament shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. He invites you to this feast of joy 
and peace. Because Jesus, who is good, is good to you. Jesus, who is kind, is kind to you. And Jesus, who is love, loves you. So may we, with the disciples, rejoice in the signs that he does as he manifests his glory. And may we, with the disciples, also believe and rejoice in him. May God grant it for Christ's sake. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thee thanks for all thy goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of thy dear Son, and for the revelation of thy kindness and mercy, and we beseech thee so to implant thy word in us that in good and honest hearts we may keep it, and bring forth fruit by patient continuance in well-doing. Lord, in your mercy. Most heartily we beseech thee so to rule and govern thy church universal with all its pastors and ministers that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of thy saving word whereby faith toward thee may be strengthened, charity increased in us toward all mankind and thy kingdom extended. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and sustain those whom thou hast sent that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people and the gospel preached in all the world, Lord, in your mercy. Grant also health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially to our President Joseph, our Vice President Kamala, our Governor Greg, our Mayor Steve, our Senators John and Ted, our Congressman Roger, our State Senator Sarah, our State Representative Gina, and our city councilwoman, Kathy. To the governor and legislature of all states and commonwealths, and to all judges and elected officials, endue them with grace to rule after thy good pleasure, to the maintenance of righteousness, to the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Lord, in your mercy. May it please thee, O Lord, to turn the hearts of our enemies and adversaries that they may cease their enmity and be inclined to walk with us in meekness and in peace. Lord, in your mercy. All who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, especially those who are suffering for thy names and for thy kingdom's sake, Comfort, O God, with thy Holy Spirit, that they may receive and acknowledge their afflictions as the manifestation of thy fatherly will, and that you would tend to them as a kind and good heavenly Father. Lord, in your mercy. Although we have deserved thy righteous wrath and manifold punishments, yet we entreat thee, O most merciful Father, remember not the sins of our youth nor our many transgressions, but out of thine unspeakable goodness, grace, and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger of body and soul, 
Preserve us from false and pernicious doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart and despair of thy mercy, and from an evil death. And in every time of trouble, show thyself a very present help, the Savior of all, especially of them that believe. Comfort those who mourn with the sure hope of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, especially those who mourn the death of your daughter Carol and your son Ingo. Lord, in your mercy, cause all needful fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. Give success to the Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations on land and sea, and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, and crown them with thy blessing. Receive, O God, our bodies and souls and all our talents, together with the offerings we bring before thee, for thou hast purchased us to be thine own, that we may live unto thee. These and whatsoever other things thou would have us ask of thee, O God, grant to us, not for our own sake, but for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, thine only Son, our Lord and Savior who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.